Hello everyone and welcome to Nikki Lyle Creative Presents with Industry Leaders where today I'm joined by Mark Fleming from Rosie Lee who's the Chief Creative Officer and Founder. Welcome today Mark, I mean it's so good to have you, I've always been a big fan of, of your work feel free to tweet about us share stuff on instagram and um, some more people can find out about industry leaders so um over to you mark welcome welcome uh, thank you thank you Nikki, for having me and uh you know uh, thank you for reaching out uh always happy to chat to share uh and uh i know mind melt but yes so first question i have for you is is how did you start out as a creative uh, many, many uh, moons ago, um, I think uh, when I was young, the options really weren't particularly brilliant. Uh, my family, uh, such as it was, was very military, go to the army. I tried the army thing. I failed that due to my asthma. And um, and then for some bizarre reason, I, I, I went, I, I, I don't know, I wasn't really aware of design in that way. I was very aware of record sleeves, was very aware of certain things out there that caught my eye. And for some reason, I, I went to uh, Bourneville College for an interview. I wore a suit. I mean, that's how long I got it. I went to an art college wearing a suit. My mother likes to go, you've got to wear a suit. Uh, and I went there and that was like a bad mistake. And then you know, it just didn't happen there. Uh, my portfolio was 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 wasn't very good and, and then I went to college and then it kind of happened from there I think I I wouldn't say I fell into design I, I'm, a, I'm a kind of old enough where people didn't really understand that there was a career to be had mm. in that uh, you know when my mother was around I'm sure she was convinced that she didn't understand what design was and she, we lived in a pub so oh, you'd be really good at doing those pub signs mom it's not that <laughs> I kind of fell into it so like I said because I have like not really understanding, but once I got the appetite, I kind of went for it. Mm. And um, at what point did you decide that you wanted to create your own agency? Um, I think uh, I've only really had one job. Um, I did some kind of things in, in the freelance skills, but I only had one job working at a, a place called Design Clinic. Uh, my friend Ash and I, we were in charge of uh, Virgin, taking care of all that kind of stuff. And uh, we, we uh, the, the kind of, how it kind of happened is my boss at the time, we were in charge of his account. As long as we had that sorted, he didn't care what we did. So mm -hmm. we used to moonlight doing stuff. I used to do record sleeve work and all the things. And then, uh, and then we won a project and then a designer came in. And then we decided then to start uh, through chatting to him about starting our own company because the company I was with, they wanted to start one, a, a, a satellite. And we'd say, do you know what? Why do all that energy for them? Let's do it for us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a good point. And so where does the name Rosie Lee come from? Um, it's pretty simple in the respect that um, my first company was Happy Tomorrow. Um, we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, and then from that, uh, me and Mark, when I separate ways, and I, I was sitting there going, okay, I need, to, I want to start a new thing. And, and it, T, Rosalie, T, um, it's pretty straightforward, but as we grew and start thought about it, it was, it kind of become like an unorthodox blend of disciplines and undisciplines. Mm -hmm. And any tea is made out of infusions and blends and herbs, and it just becomes like a, like, a, yeah, a kind of really crazy thing. And I think at the founding part, part of Rosalie, we had photographers, we had illustrators, we had DJs, we had all kinds of crazy people around. And that made a really nice brew. And that's how it kind of became. Oh, and also there was a, a, a gypsy Rosalie uh, who was someone that used to uh, look into the future. And I was really excited about brands like IDO uh, so agencies like ITO and how they used to think future forward and always like that sort of, you know, solve problems to things that have yet to be thought of. Yeah. Okay. 
And um, so you, you have mentioned to me before that in the early days, you said that Rosie Lee was a bit kind of feral before um, the agency then formed and developed. So what were those days like? Um, it was nuts in the sense that you know, this was Shoreditch before Shoreditch is now. You know, you wouldn't yeah. even walk across Shoreditch then. You know, there was lots of DJs, musicians, kind of like a kind of bit of a kind of weird kind of alternative crowd there. And uh, a friend of ours uh, said, hey, I've got a friend. He's got a hairdressers. He's got a space downstairs. Why don't you go in there? So our first studio uh, was underneath the hairdressers and literally every once in a while, and hair would fall down. And uh, some of our original kind of uh, presentations, you go to client meetings, and literally go, <sighs> and yeah, it was kind of fun. It was kind of stupid. And it was kind of, you know, it wasn't too serious in that respect. You kind of were looking, we were just passionate about doing nice work and not really worrying about money as such. Obviously we did, but not like how we did now. And then through the, the, the record studios nearby, you just met some very interesting artists, uh, a guy called Long, right? He used to come by, he used to do all the basement jack stuff. He had Andrew uh, Weatherall, he used to roll through and things like that. And again, it was just a very kind of eclectic thing. And I kind of inspired by IDO, is seeing that kind of melting pot of creatives, mm. you know, uh, all kind of mashing together. And it was kind of a bit nuts, to say the least. And a lot of, uh, yeah, lots of strange things happening. And, and what type of clients did you start working with? Well, uh, our first uh, client number one was Andrew Weatherall. Um, we were helping him with his uh, record label and uh, DJ club management. But the second uh, client was Nike, uh, the second job. Uh, we were lucky enough to be brought in to do a project for Nike Young Directors. And then from there began the, uh, the crazy roller coaster that is uh, working with them for 20 years. So and Andrew was our first client and Nike was our second. That's amazing. I've never heard of um, a kind of more startup new agency nabbing a big client like Nike. Um, well, uh, it, it's interesting because at those first first months, years, I was intimidated. You know, people say, hey, guys, can we come to your studio? No, 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 no. We'll come to you. You know, because yeah, yeah. no one wants to come to the bottom of the hairdressers. <laughs> you know, uh, no, no, don't worry about it. And like, uh, and every once in a while, like I had friends roll through. My wife uh, would come sit at desk, and we kind of blag it. There was more people and things like that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's and like, yeah, the the Nike thing only, and and also I think I realised that uh, I was scared of like not being looking like I was able to take on these projects. So mm. yeah, it, it kind of that that scare that fear probably made me push harder. Uh, and, and then I kind of realised, especially when you start working and competing with companies like Widens, that really scale is relative because the budgets dictate the scale. So. Yeah. And so like the, the clients that you've worked with are, are incredible. And um, how did you manage to win those accounts over the years? Is there like a formula or a secret or...? I, there's no formula, I think. Uh, no, no. They're, 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 I think... Um, Nike, you know, uh, a great brand to work with, very passionate, intense. Uh, and, you know, we kind of grew a little bit. And then the more we grew, the more Nike gave us. And then it just became a thing, you know. Uh, and it took us a while actually to, to diversify out from uh, Nike, you know, to things like uh, Uniqlo uh, and uh yeah, we just went out to a bit, uh, we, I think it was like 10 years ago, so listen, this is nuts. Uh, we've got a lot of really strong Nike relationship, but like it can get a bit, you know, it's not particularly a solid base, so we started going out. And also the Nike thing uh, is a powerful thing to have in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think working with them opened many doors. And then also, uh, yeah. You know, and also I was always surprised that people even even heard of us. I'm even surprised that people have heard of us now. You know, obviously people are very aware of the work that we've done, but they don't 
know of us. We're very hard to find. You, know, you can't Google Air Max Day. You know, we'll be like the millionth page. So we're quite, I like being quite aloof when it comes to things like that. Mm. And do you um, have a particular like process or style at Rosie Lee? Um, when we were happy tomorrow, we had a very distinct aesthetic. Um, it was pretty solid aesthetic. Uh, and, but I learned then when, when you go to uh, clients or you go to agencies and they go, nice style will give you a call when that, when that job comes in. And what usually happened is that call never happened. So when we started Rosie Lee, we made a conservative effort. I made a conservative effort not to have house style or aesthetic uh, because they could, they become in and out of vogue. Uh, they're easily copied and things like that. Uh, and then we, we decided on an approach, which is storytelling and narrative. Uh, at the time, it was a bit like a one-inch punch. You know, when we're working with brands like Nike who are doing Yoga Benito or the uh, Brazil advert, these um, iconic TV spots, we, we focus on how do you tell a story in a still image? So that was our kind of, our mantra 20 years ago. How do you emotionally connect and tell stories? That's our kind of, that's our thread that goes through our work. What is the narrative? Mm-hmm. And and you've also got offices in like New York, Amsterdam, and Frome as well. So was that organic growth? How did you set uh, this up? I think it was. Uh, we did something called Twenty Twenty. I can't remember when it was. About six years ago, we sat down and uh, me and the uh, Russ and Joe kind of sat down and said, "Okay, then what do we want to do? You know, this is fun, uh, but what 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 can we do?" And we, you know, should we open a restaurant? Should we open a shop? Shall we buy offices? Shall we do this? And as a part of the, the whole thing, it was like expansion. You know, uh, we work around and, you know, expansion is really good uh, to kind of diversify, mix it all up a little bit. So the first office was Amsterdam. You know, the guys in Amsterdam, uh, you know, they really, really helped us. English speaking predominantly, close. Uh, some clients are there so it's you know from there we then opened Froome because uh, Russell moved down there that's our digital hub and then you know a couple of years ago I kind of said hey New York yeah and I think I think by growing and expanding it's had its problems obviously um, from one point of view but in some respects having a global uh, point of view kind of helps us uh, keep all the wheels all going and give us touch points. Yeah. And and so do the overseas offices all collaborate together um, and share projects and clients or do you work as separate entities more? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the thing. Uh, I think, um, yes, we do collaborate. Yes. Uh, but then ultimately it, it was set up in the sense that Okay, then if you're going to go to New York or you to, people have to kind of stand on their own feet, if we're always moving work around, then it kind of defeats the object. But then equally, it's another one of our secret weapons is, you know, you can turn a seven hour day into a 16 hour day, yeah. you know, quite easily by tapping into, you know, when it's um, bank holiday here, the US or Amsterdam can work. You know, and then also it kind of really, really creates a, a thing. And we're lucky enough to have really uh, great teams in each one who know each other well. That can literally create uh, a thing. Uh, but then also working and collaborating remotely across time zones can be a challenge. But we'll, we'll we try our best. Is that me beeping or you beeping? Oh, I think that might be me. Sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to you cover every <laughs> single possible thing that could bleep and one thing escapes you. Um, so when you're growing your overseas offices, I know some companies have a system where they'll bring someone into London and then they'll monitor and nurture them, grow them there, and then they send them overseas. Is that what you do at Rosie Lee? Or? I think, uh, firstly, Froome was easy because uh, Russell... Uh, once to get out of London, he moved down to there. I mean, that's that's a relatively easy thing. Amsterdam was a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, 
recruiting in the different territories quite hard and it took a while to to find the pace to have the culture to bring the culture in you know you don't want to go go there and be in it oh this is Rosalie intimate you know when you're kind of pumping out the whole thing what's the point so it took us a while to nurture uh, um, culture within that office you know what's the point of having a Dutch office if everyone's English same with America so the thing is is like yes we, we uh, a couple of key people went started worked uh, James moved to Amsterdam after, well, Amsterdam was gone for two years no three years and then uh, James went over to kind of help solidify it was it was that was quite pivotal to take someone who knew some of our DNA um, and you know again a lot of the stuff we do is not easily taught um, so having that kind of thing and then me moving to New York I kind of I think the UK team were glad to see me go in one respect but I took a, a big as aspect of our culture over to the US so I think being able to uh, propagate for want of a better word you know divide and conquer a, a thing that set it out then hopefully it can transplant transplant into that territory but then equally grow and be a a variation of the original kind of Rosalina's. Yeah. And um, do, do you have any personal favorite projects that Rosie Lee's produced? Um, I think yes, and for different things. I'm really, really proud of virtually everything that we do. Um, you know, whether I've touched it or I see our team doing it, things like that. Some of the big ones, um, way back when, you know, doing Arsenal, Man United, and things like that. Um, I'm really proud of how we pivoted and changed what was typically uh, a very generic football, what someone understands of a football like mm -hmm. this. So we kind of worked out if, if you've got David Beckham or Thierry for like 15 minutes, getting to do something and then we can complement into stuff. So some of that uh, formative uh, work that we do with football uh, or soccer, depending on where you are in the world, uh, that was amazing. And that really did change a lot of what Nike kind of do from a retail and image kind of point of view. Then moving forwards, our work that we do with crews, you know, like Track Mafia, Run Them Crew, and some of the people around the world, that is really, uh, from a community point of view, you see the power of that. And more recently, the work that we do with our friends in China, uh, like the Air Max Day work, which which really does set a, a new cadence for what is a kind of a, a brand launch. So, yeah, and they're the big ones that jump out. and I'm sure more will pop into my head as we talk. Mm. And, and so going back to Rondem Crew and Track Mafia, could you tell us a bit more about those? So um, Nike introduced us to Charlie, Charlie Dark. Um, he uh, was, there was a space uh, called 1948, which was uh, a space that was kind of community space that was pre the London Olympics. And we were asked to kind of brand and, and design their HQ. And then from that, you know, we formed a really good relationship and you know, started running together, starting meeting other creatives, uh, young people from the community. And it just was a powerful, well, it is, it is a, a, such a powerful kind of catalyst for introductions. You know, you, know, you turn up with running gear. There's no preconception. So everyone's the same. And then suddenly, when you get changed afterwards, someone's wearing suits, hoodies, and this, and you go, whoa, you know, there's DJs, musicians, uh, ambulance drivers, you know, all kinds of, there's all kinds of people. And then suddenly, you know, they, you're getting exposed to musicians and filmmakers, and then you go, oh, yeah. And it's a, an amazing resource. And same with uh, Corey at Trap Mafia, which we met through uh, Rundem. You know, again, I really enjoy using. Uh, partnering with them and somewhat uh, adding a, a kind of a powerful aesthetic to what they're doing that is a bit more sharper 
I think sometimes the work that we do, uh, Charlie and Corey, uh, can be a bit more potent. You know, sometimes brands kind of don't want to use those images or use those words, um, but we then we can be more kind of sharper and be more kind of culturally on point. And I think, you know, again, when you work with so-called charitable things, they can still be cool. They can still be uh, aspirational. And you see some things that local councils do. Yeah, they're cool, but is that aspirational? And the work we do with Charlie and Corey talks to the same communities, but makes it a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit aspirational and uh yeah and more motivational mm. and that's all through the medium of, of running as well as a yeah it's it's uh running's the new golf uh and you know i've uh, been lucky to to travel the world um you know asia well through through that we met nike china which then began amex day traveled the world uh, you know to hong kong where we met joseph who then became a part of uh, Rosalie. Sammy was a, what was what they called with a younger. He came to work for us. He then left, goes to work for Nike Energy. You know, you've got Matt, who, we, who I met in Copenhagen, who now is my uh, kind of our account director in New York. So through these kind of community things, people come together who would never ordinarily meet and, and they come together through a common thing. And then that's, that's how we kind of recruit, how we network and how we connect. Well, that was one thing I wanted to ask you actually, Mark, is what do you look for when you're recruiting for a creative to join Rosie Lee? It's a funny one. I kind of look at them and I kind of go, can I sit on a 13 hour flight with this person? <laughs> um, I think what we're looking for are emotional designers, not technical designers. Yes, mm. yes we do want and need technical designers. Right. But actually, emotive, you know, why is that good? Why is that color so perfect? Why does that resonate? So, people that kind of uh, that can actually tra- take creativity and then inject, I don't know, something like a soul to it, um, as opposed to something really technical, which is obviously very beautiful, but equally can be a bit cold and a little bit kind of like void of, of anything. You know, it'd be beautifully crafted and, you know, very designery, if I want that word. Whereas something that's emotional and deep can connect with some kid in Harlem, some guy in Hackney, or, you know, if it's something like that, then you kind of desire it. So emotional designers and emotional people uh, is what we kind of look for. Yeah, I have a lot of um, agencies say that to me, that the the skill set is all great and well and you can make things look pretty and you can make it look nice but unless you can explain as you said Mark like why does that color what's the significant there and there's a backstory and there's a back catalog of reference in culture uh, where someone is is informed I think designers need to really be like avid readers and um, delving into culture and communities and then bringing that into the work yeah, I mean, if you, if you don't know the why, then the you know the why will inform the what. Yeah. You know, and you should be able to look at it. You may not be able to get it, but you understand it. You know, you know, there's many things that we create, and I go, hey, I understand that talks about this scene or this. It's not my scene, but I get that scene. You know, that's yeah. I mean, and yeah, I think when we talk about it. It's about understanding the world that we work in. You know, yes, we work with trends uh, and use culture and global stuff. So we look for people who are that absorb that uh, and kind of like can inform us of what's really cool, who's really interesting, what clubs really going on, what music is this, because then we all weave that into our work. Mm, definitely. And um uh, do you have any like horror stories of things that have gone horribly wrong? Uh, nothing goes horribly wrong. No, <laughs> no, no. Uh, I think nothing really jumps out. But apart, yeah, yeah. Of course, there's been speed bumps. Uh, yes, you know the thing would be is uh, I think nothing ever goes to plan. You know, um, a photo shoot. You say you've got an hour. An hour. You've got thirty minutes. You say you've got this and you've got that. I think 
I think uh, because we've got used to working in a certain arena, I think you build up a resilience or a kind of a strength, but flexible like bamboo. You know, nothing ever goes to plan. You know, so the idea is if you have contingencies and things like that, you know, and you have trusted partners and things, you can kind of always work it out. You know, it's, yeah, as Tyson said, everyone's got a plan to you smacked in the nose. But like, that's the thing. We always tend to have contingencies. Uh, and a big part of what Rosie is about and the kind of secret weapon is our uh, our project team. You know, they're very resourceful, very kind of problem solving, things like that. So they are, they always have contingencies and contingencies. We always have an after, a backup plan. And you know what, you can always stay late to work it out. Yeah. A, a musician friend of mine once said that it's only a wrong note depending on what note follows after it. And I think that, um, you know, you can think it's a mistake, but it's all about the follow-up afterwards and how you save it and rectify it as well. Yeah, some, some of the most famous things in Rosalie history of, of like, have come from a mishap or, or, or uh, um, you know, uh, it kind of shows the humanity. I think I was saying, you know, one of the beginning meetings I had with a client, uh, I was at Nike meeting and we were presenting some work and I stood up jumping around saying, oh yeah, I want it like this. I want this guy to go like this. And I didn't notice that the chair had slid back and I, I fell down onto the floor. And this was quite a, a senior uh, client meeting. And then you go, in one respect, that would be mortifying, but you just get up and go, right, don't worry about that, let's go. And then again, you know, um, nothing is perfect. Nothing ever goes to plan, irregardless you know, look at what we're in now. You had, you may have had a contingency uh, plan for this year. It's all gone out the window now. But the idea is, if you if you trust the team, trust the process, then you know, good things will happen. Mm. And um, what advice would you give to juniors starting out in the industry at the moment? Um, obviously, uh, a tough time to come out, uh, but it's always been a tough time. You know. Uh, more and more people want to be a part of this industry you know people understand it you know there's like there's jobs and, and careers that i you know you know what i mean it's 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 insane how many ways you can uh, fulfill your creative you know your, you know your desires you know from being a photographer to be a coder to be an animator to be an art director to be a zine work, to be a blogger you know to be creative you know it's almost anything i think yes it's obviously a bit um, of a challenge now uh, but now you know train you know uh, it's easier in one respect than ever before to launch and to share your work you know i want to a cause there's a lot of you know you know this year, you know, creating work for WHO, you know, things that are happening currently in the world, you know, create work to kind of support them, champion that, you know, find communities and businesses that, you know, that are innovating and doing stuff, offer uh, a creative point of view to that. And I think, again, observe and uh, learn and uh, teach, uh, not teach, but sorry, uh, study watch loads of stuff and just really kind of prepare yourself because it's like i said it's always been tricky it's just a little bit more trickier today yeah i think at the moment everyone's overwhelmed by all the noise of social media and the fact that you can get your work out there online it's not like the traditional days of you'd have to be carrying a, a portfolio around and real life connections you can reach out through like linkedin twitter instagram but then everyone's doing the same so we're all very overwhelmed by content yeah i mean it, it, it's it's you know it's easier than ever before to make a film do a track and things like you don't need a record label anymore you know i'm sure you've got certain things or some great music's come from a bed, bed bedroom around the corner or this and that i think the the only problem now is that the the the, the access the, the ability to access it is so much there's so much competition and so much things and then, and then the algorithms and things like that, and, and how how do you cut through that 
that's if you can cut through today in this crowded, then you've got something, I, I believe. Yeah, definitely. And I think one of the, the things I always say to juniors as well is, is be prepared. If, if a senior person such as yourself is going to give up 10, 20 minutes of your time to see someone, they need to make sure that they've got their laptop all fully charged, all their work on there to show. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's some really funny people that rock up and they go, hey, uh, I've come for an interview. Oh, I'm in the area. And like, if anyone knocks on the door, if anyone's got, you know, the attitude to knock on the door, uh, if, if, if I'm free, I'll always make the time. So, hey, come on in, let's grab 20 minutes. You know, that's what someone did for me. Uh, Adrian Sean, see your intro. You know, I was you came down from Birmingham. You know, walked around for interviews, knocked on studio doors, and I intro. Uh, Adrian opened the door. You know, I think at that time I didn't even know who he was. In that respect, I just saw intro design, and and he, you know, he, he spent twenty minutes and gave me what was then the creative handbook, which was like the almanac of everything. And uh, and, and since then, anyone who's who's brazen enough. And bold enough to knock on the door um, deserves at least 20 minutes. And then also be prepared. Please don't come in and say, hey, you know, can I use one of your laptops to present? No, all our laptops, yeah. are, you know, or, you know, uh, so come relatively prepared because it's a bit of a waste of time if you're just going to come in and kind of flop it. But this is it, like everyone I've spoken to in the series that is like an industry leader has said, we like people approaching us, having the guts to, to put themselves out there. But if you do, just make sure you utilise our time when you've got that for that moment, just deliver. Um, so this is one thing that I'm always saying to juniors at the moment. It is tough out there. Um, it is competitive, but just try to stand out where you can. The thing is, is like everyone's got to start somewhere. And I see that when I see some kids knock on the door being sheepish, I see myself in them, you know, in that, in like I had to do that. And I, and I, and it's like a kindredness. Sometimes when people come in, they're all like, right, sit down on the new creative director. And you go, no. Nah. But, you know, yeah. it, to show a bit of vulnerability, show that you're kind of like, you know, um, you've got something about you because equally, when that, when that energy comes in, like we were telling earlier, ability is one thing, attitude is something else. Can that person, again, sit in a, a you know, many of our client meetings happen in bars, restaurants, wherever. So can you sit down and chat to someone, you know, away from work? You know, can you talk about, hey, why don't you want to that new flying like yourself? Oh, God, oh cool. You know, so does that person have more skills beyond the actual design skills? You know, do they have that kind of confidence to, if someone's got, is brazen enough to come into our studio, you know, it's, we're pretty easy going, but I can imagine it's a bit intimidating. It's the same, the same kind of attitude that can walk into a photo shoot and command, you know, authority over whoever, you know, that's the thing. So that sort of confidence, okay, we can use that. We can send that guy to Paris and he can present to whoever, you know, you know what I mean? So that kind of energy is important. Definitely being confident, but being humble as well. Because if juniors come in, as you say, someone thinking they're the next creative director and then you instantly, you don't warm to them as much, but um, seeing potential. Um, I guess, but uh, definitely my time in America has taught me, you know, um, this is going to sound probably sound a bit crass, but like Britain uh, produces such creative, amazing creative talent, but sometimes we're not always as confident. We're very humble and very kind of meek about it. Um, you go to New York and everyone's like, yep, yeah, you know, they're on you, they're this and this, but sometimes their work doesn't live up to their kind of brashness. But if you can learn to, to like be a little bit more confident, a little bit more outgoing, matched with like the humbleness and the kind of integrity, that's a real powerful mix. And it's something we look for a lot. This is something clients always say to me is that we want someone that's, that's good 
but not overly arrogant, no big egos that are going to completely disrupt the flow of the agency. Um, but so going back to the kind of personality type as well, um, what other sorts of skills do you like someone to be able to bring in regards to like software is keynote and after effects something that you look for um i'm a bit mixed because uh, you know i i see young creatives come to us and yes they've got killer portfolios but it's a bit what they have is a bit unusable in that respect it's very kind of flat and things like that but you know okay then how can this be brought to life so again after effects uh, sketch up you know, um, really, really great tools, you know, to kind of make some aesthetic alive. A SketchUp we use a lot for spatial design. Um, and it doesn't have to be like amazing, you know, yes, we've got guys that can do some incredible CGI and spatial stuff, but generally, you know, A4 pieces of paper, you know, don't really tell you proportions of scale and just crudely putting things, throwing shapes, into Google, uh, Google Slide, not Google Slides, uh, SketchUp can really kind of help you kind of understand and navigate stuff. And it's a really good, powerful tool to understand how things can move and kind of flow and proportion and scale. And same with After Effects, you know, brands aren't static now, right? So if a little playful bounce or a little twist or things like that, or even presentations, you know, you talked about Keynote, we bring a lot of After Effects into Keynote and actually make more compelling brand present presentations. So it feels like, you know, it's a bit more, you know, no one wants to sit on a presentation and click, click, click. You want to go bang, you know what I mean? So it's engaging. You know, some of the people that we, we present to, you know, you don't have the luxury of hours. You've got 15, 20 minutes. You've got to be able to like, one each punch get really uh, smart so having a really impactful presentation in keynote or using after effects can really be effective that's some of the highest paid jobs i come across in the industry actually is keynote freelancers like the day rates clients will pay for someone that's incredible with their presentations yeah, um, yeah it's, and, and it's google slides as well you know we've we, because of our the way we work with territories Google is really good, you know, for collaborating. Keynote's very, very good, not very collaborative in that way, right? But I, I Keynote is my go-to because it's very self-contained. Mm. Right? But then Slides is is the one we're, we're using more and more for collaboration, especially now that everyone's working from home, our design, everyone can work on a document live. Uh, yeah. Keynote doesn't really have that uh, capability yet. So what changes have you seen in the retail sector over the years? I think uh, it's always been changing. It's always been evolving. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I've seen is, again, going to Asia a lot, and you kind of see how things move faster. They shop with WeChat and things like that. I think we're a bit slow to get to that um online shopping uh, and things like that i think we've always kind of um i think because we're consumers first and we tend to work with very very progressive brands we kind of have to be really progressive uh, storytelling um and experience is really experiential and kind of you know that sort of stuff is and having touch points is getting more and more important. The actual delivery of product, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm forever going to a place, look at it, and then I kind of like, okay, I'll get that to do at home. So I think retail is, has to become more augmented. So uh, I feel that digital doesn't quite have emotion, but then equally uh, physical doesn't have I know, the richness of like, you know, or, you know, more touch points and I don't know, it's just, I don't believe that physical or digital will win, it's the meshing of the two. And I believe, you know, uh, retail will become more social and more community based, you know, um, redesigning the high streets and the t malls of the world 
just to kind of take that down so it becomes more community based. Because if we just became shopping online, what else would we do? So retail will just change into a more of a, a social uh, experience. Yeah. And so how has Rosie Lee been affected by COVID at the moment? We've, uh, it's kind of hit us, uh, we've had three, three sort of waves as such, because we're a global company uh, and we, we do do a lot of work in uh, China. You know, uh, it hit us first, uh, maybe November, you know, there was rumblings of something happening. You know, obviously from a, an outside point of view, it's hard to understand, you know, all the things. Uh, and then it just, so things, some of the briefs that we would have been working on that would have launched in March and things like that, they were all canned. And then um, when it took hold here, um, yes, definitely it kind of slowed up. You know, we, we we're still quite busy doing things, but uh, a lot of the work we do are very kind of uh, experiential where people come together and... And I think we 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 really we switch quite quickly. Is that how do we bring this community online? How do you make it virtual? And a lot of the work that we've been doing recently uh, is really how do you celebrate communities and how do we kind of empower them and bring them together and facilitate uh, communities? So mm-hmm. yes, it has affected us quite a lot, right? but then equally. Um, some of it will be for the better as well and hopefully help us all innovate. Yeah. And um, have you had to follow anybody in the team? So, yes, our, our, our work, because we have uh, three offices, uh, we furloughed the major- majority, uh, half of our UK team mm. uh, at the beginning. Uh, we had big uh, projects on, so we need certain uh, skills and things like that. Then luckily the Dutch and the US team picked up uh, some of the, the slack. So I think it's been really helpful in order to, you know, what the British government has done has been very generous. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's really, really helped us. But then through that gift as such, or that support, we're able to support the other territories where in their, you know, the, the governments respectively haven't got done those sort of things. So it's, because of what we've managed to do here has benefited the rest of our uh, offices. Mm. I found that with a lot of clients I work with that have like international offices, it's that kind of like plate spinning of um, navigating through all of this. Mm. Have you found that budgets have really been affected with clients as well? Uh, well, I mean, in all honesty, uh, budgets over the last year have been changing anyway you know in you know the way the way things have been done you know i think what's been happening is is obviously sped up a lot of things that have happened um i think if anything budgets are frozen um and yes things have, have, have shrunk in that respect but then equally we were chatting recently you know i think people have been very inventive at home. And I think it goes to show that actually you don't need tens of thousands of pounds to do a video. Or, you know, if you see what people like Corey and Charlie and other people are doing themselves, it's amazing, like, what you can do. So does that kind of make sense? Is yeah. Yes, the big budgets have changed. You know, you've seen, like, Randa Nation on TV now where they were doing it through Skype and um, Zoom. So it makes you wonder, hey, do we ever need to go back into a studio anyway? So yeah, I think a lot of people will kind of think when we go back to uh, normal, wherever that may be, I think a lot of that, a lot of that will stay and go, do you know what? We can do this smarter or differently, you know, and I think that will come through the budgets. With any challenge, that's when you see the greatest creativity and people overcoming stuff. And as you say, working out technologies of Zoom, I hadn't even really personally used Zoom about a month and a half ago. And I'm running all these events for it for the community. 
um, the creative cr community. So that's another way I'm, I'm reaching out. And that's what you do. You just problem solve and try and come up with solutions all the time. And well, I mean, if, if, if you're following a formula that you normally do, then yeah, you're right. You know, we don't really innovate. You know, we've done this because we've always done that. You know, uh, we were approached earlier this year to launch a car and um, there was no car. There was only one car. Uh, we had to do a launch in New York, uh, and and the client was saying, "I'm not sure if we can do this brief. You know, we can't we can't do a car launch in New York without a car." And you go, "Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a bit that's a bit intense, but like, what a creative challenge! So, how do you launch a car? And like, I mean, the project didn't go ahead because of obviously how everything's all gone. But I was genuinely excited with that limitation. Uh, you know." No one has ever launched a car without a car, as far as I'm aware. So we know whatever we would have done would have been unique, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, through through kind of you know, and again with creatives, you know, uh, I'm really I'm really keen. Like if the briefs really tight or the budgets really tight, you know, that's where I think creativity really, you know, if you've got loads of time and a big budget, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can do good work. But I'm most proud of the things that we've done against the arts. You know, that that's, you know, doing some of the photo shoots that we've done, you know, in 15 minutes when we should have had four hours. And it still looked really good. You know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it kind of, that, that kind of shows that you can, you know, you're, you are, you know, you're of a level. Can you sw switch it on? And do you think at the moment, because obviously you've worked through a couple of recessions over the years and weathered the storms, do you think we're entering one now? Um, yes. I, 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 the thing is, is iterate, uh, re respond quickly, be clear, uh, be kind mm -hmm. as well, you know, uh, uh, to everyone, you know, and, you know, there's been many... There's been many evolutions of, you know, when film went to digital, you know, that was a great change. You know, the, the recession is from like, you know, I think I've worked professionally between like two, maybe three, uh, and even like cultural shifts and things like that, technology shifts. You know, I think as long as you're innovating and or you're learning and being true, and also if you're lucky enough well, I don't know, just you can, the, sometimes the writing is on the wall and you just got to be able to see it and prepare for it. And, and, you know, don't be afraid of making tough decisions. And, you know, if you're transparent, you know, uh, you, will, you will make it through. And, 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 in, and, in, and if you have to make some tough decisions, you know, because you've been transparent and honest and fair, everyone will respect that. You know, um, so yeah, it's tough, um, but you know, I mean that's why we've um, we kind of stay quite small. We could have grown, you know, quite easily, and I think by being nimble and have multi skills and things like that, it's enabled us to re-educate teams, relearn skills, and have uh, multi specialists that allows us to kind of like pivot more and more yeah and what with a lot of people at the moment being in lockdown and some people i know have spoken about kind of philosophizing about their lives and things like the consumption etc and new ways of living and being do you think consumers mindsets have changed especially as we're entering a new normal um i'm optimistic i i'll be quite i'll be quite upset if after all this we go back to how it was mm. uh, because you know i don't know i think there's an important lesson you know maybe we have lost our way maybe happiness is not this you know you know i mean i think you know perspective is being you know maybe i mean as russell kind of would say make a living not a killing you know it's amazing you know, uh, you get a new kind of narrative and you kind of have a think, you know, maybe I don't need to commute so much. Maybe I don't need to do this. Maybe, that, you know, maybe 
I'm working too hard or maybe, you know, so I think reflection and things like that. And I'm hoping, you know, yes, you know, people want to get back to get back to doing stuff, but, you know, maybe just not quite like how it was, you know, from the client point of view, from a social point of view and from a future point of view, you know, it obviously wasn't perfect before this. So now we got a real great opportunity to kind of bring in new things personally and social, you know, as a business and as a, you know, as a society. Yeah, I agree. It's, it has been a very interesting time to monitor the fact we've all just been in lockdown, locked away, and then how we re-emerge back into the world um, and how we start socialising again and interacting again. Um, but I'm just mindful of time and I've got a couple of questions here. So I just want to say thank you so much for answering my mark and let's uh, get through to the, the Q&A. Um, so first question is, do you have any advice for a graphic designer and illustrator wanting to get into art direction? Um, I think like I kind of said is uh, when we started Rosalie, we had no art directors, you know, we were graphic designers. We're still graphic designers in that respect. I think art direction is, is, is composition, well, it depends what it, kind of art direction it is. Is it, you know, still life after, you know, photography art direction, film art direction, or actually curating. So it, it's, I'd ask what is art direction first, because like art, you know, an art director would probably not do any work, but know how to bring, uh, actually be hands on, but know how to bring a team together, or an art director would be someone who would kind of curate shorts and things like that. So just to be a good kind of taste maker and be, you know, know the world, absorb as much kind of reference points as well. So you can kind of like reference all these things, mm. you know, a bit of a tough one because I don't know what, what the definition of art director is in that question. Oh, it's so vague art director in every different discipline and industry. It's completely different. Um, like in advertising, illustration, design, integrated branding, it's all totally different. So, um, next question is, what's your favourite books or websites? Um, I've kind of, I don't tend not to look at websites like that because there was a time when I used to go and bookmark in everything and then I give up because they're not there anymore, you know, because it's all changing. Um, books wise um, because I'm dyslexic as such, uh, it's very hard to me to read uh, and, and, and things like that so every once in a while I get given books to read but some of my favourite books are over there you know I've got uh, a couple of books by Dieter Rams uh, Saul Bass and, and Paul Rand are like design gods you know those guys they you know some of the logos that they've got and things that they've done, you know, stand the test of time. And, you know, that's really pure, pure graphics. Uh, I must admit, uh, I've got, I do have books, obviously, but uh, a good friend of mine kind of said, if you kind of look at all these books, they'll start entering your head and you'll start emulating them. So maybe get books on oranges or, or other things and be inspired. If you have design books, then you might start, inadvertently copying them but if you get a books on chairs or postcards you know then does that kind of make sense by opening yeah. a kind of reference point then you you're not polluting your mind with like doing rip-offs or riffs. you might think you're being authentic or being quite uh, sophisticated but it's in, inadvertently you're kind of emulating something so have other things around you to inspire you well, that, one of my favourite exhibitions I've been to was at the Barbican and it was all about artists' collections and Andy Warhol was mad about cookie jars. So all his collection of cookie jars. And then um, they had like Martin Parr, certain like postcard collections and that's quite interesting to see. Um, so another question is around where do you find your inspiration and how do you keep your ideas fresh? 
Um, I think that's a tough one. I mean, it's the team, to be honest. It's the team, you know. Um, I tend to uh, dance through the studio as most creative directors do, go la 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 la, you know, in, in Cuckoo Land, and the, the, our team are kind of doing it. But, you know, they, they, are, they are the ones, you know, they keep me inspired. Uh, and I try to stay abreast of many things. Um, and we kind of like, again, like a, a mixture of ages and things like that. You know, when you have been around, you know that certain things have gone before. Uh, and you go, okay, then that was done 20, 30, 40 years ago. How do we modernize that? So how do you bring all those kind of things together, you know, to be unique and fresh? I, 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 I don't think there is such a thing, you know, because there's so much that's been done. So how do you inspire and splice and mold and things like that? So I think that's, well, of course, there's new things to be formed, but generally, you know, you've got to kind of, always be looking, always be copying, uh, not copying, kind of assimilating and absorbing stuff and kind of mashing it all together. Mm. And, you know, it's, and also one of the things that we do uh, a lot is, even though formatively we did a lot of football work, I actually don't like football. I used to walk around with the athletes' names and like, what is his name? You know, <laughs> and I think sometimes, uh, being aware of something is important, but having a naive point of view gives a fresh perspective, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, you know, so sometimes be aware of something, but also try to be an outsider so you don't, you know. Yeah. So next question is, do you ever experience creative block and how you deal with it? I think that answers what you said before about the team inspiring you, but it's, do you ever... Have creative block yourself. Um, I have, I have doubts, and you kind of like, oh, of course, it, it's 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 the curse of a creative. You can't just turn it on and off. Um, what I try to do a lot is um, watch watch really a lot of really bad films. I think sometimes, um, or go for. I don't run as much as I do, but like, I think if I if I, I tend not to have those sort of blocks because I don't overthink. Um, what I mean by that is if, you, if you're able to watch a dreadful film that just about engaging enough to kind of throw you off, uh, then, then a random thought will come in. Does that make sense? If you sit there and concentrate, it's very hard for things to come to you. So if you get kind of loose, and then like, it's a bit like people say the best ideas come in the shower. I think today, we're so overstimulated all the time. It's very hard to have to daydream and have happy accidents because you're occupied by everything. It's all consuming. So I, I purposely make time to tinker in the garden and watch a really, you know, Armageddon or something. You know, it's a really film that I've seen a thousand times that kind of loosens my brain up for random thoughts. Yeah. Um, so I'll get to the last question and then we'll wrap this up. But um, so with an incredible 20 years behind you at Rosie Lee, what's next for you and the team? Uh, <laughs> it's quite a big question, uh, isn't it? Uh, very uncertain. Uh, I, I, think, I think, you know, in all honesty, you know, uh, Joe, uh, one of our partners, one of our partners, he said to me, Mark, you know, he started with us on a many, many years ago, about 17 years ago, actually. He was young when he joined. So you always knew this was going to be successful. You always knew this. And I said, no, I, you, know, you know, I think if you work on the proviso, they could all disappear tomorrow. You know, um, I don't know what the next 20 days looks like, the next 20 years. I think the old is like, appreciate what you have, work towards it, have a, I don't know, it's, it's just to kind of appreciate what you have and kind of try and enjoy doing it, work with cool people, have fun. And I mean, I'm consciously going out of my way to find the next generation to take Rosalie forward. 
you know, we already are doing that and we already are doing this. You know, I'm taking more and more of a back seat. Most of the board and the directors are taking more of a back seat. So it becomes theirs essentially. And I think through that, it will become a little bit more long lasting because then, you know, it's very hard for doing it as long as you have to keep the energy to the resilience. Uh, and you, you know, when you're happy around, you kind of like go, I can't do it again. I can't do this again. I can't, another really difficult time, but, uh, that experience has helped, but, uh, but then equally the energy of our, our team kind of propels me forward. Yeah. Well, I think we've got some more questions there, but I'm going to wrap this up for you, Mark, because I know you're incredibly busy, but I just really appreciate you spending an hour of your time with us. Um, lots of the comments I've had from people have been saying how inspiring and insightful they found it. So, um, yeah, as I said to everyone earlier, feel free to tweet about us, share stuff on Instagram, especially things that you found useful. And, um, yeah. Thanks again, Mark, and good luck. Yeah, I think, you know, I think in summary, you know, I've tried not to swear. <laughs> uh, uh, I think my message is, you know, fuck it up without fucking it up. Just go for it. You know, yeah. the worst that can happen, you know, if you're a young creative, just go for it. If you're an OG, you know, or whatever, you know, just go for it. I mean, that's the thing, if you're passionate and you're true to yourself, then if it does go wrong or a client does say this, at least you said I've done my best. Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Bye thanks. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Nice one. All right. Bye. Bye bye.